Good morning, I'm Lori. I'm the Connections Coordinator here at ABC, and we're thankful that you joined us today for church. We want to make sure that you know that every week, Mondays and Tuesdays, our elders and staff get together and we pray for our church and we pray for the needs of our people. So we would love to know how we can pray for you. And if you can email us at the email below, we would love to add you to our prayer list. We have several things coming up that we want to make you aware of. Uh, the first one, we're going to be having a connections class. Of course, that's one of my favorite things. It's going to be on September 26th. That's at 9 o'clock, and we're going to meet in the Student Center. It's really a chance for you to get to know ABC, the pastors, and the staff, and for us to get to know you, and then to help you get connected so that you can get plugged into ministries at our church. We also have three, four new groups coming up. We have an apologetics class, which teaches you how to defend your faith. We have Life's Healing Choices, which is a ministry of CR. We have a marriage and parenting group. And then we have a group that's specifically for 18 to 30 year olds called Young Adult Life. You can sign up for any of those groups on our website by clicking Find a Group. We also have a CR barbecue coming up. It's an event that they're calling Come See CR. So it's a chance for you to get to know more about the ministry of CR. It's gonna include a barbecue and also testimonies from people who've really changed their lives. And it really is gonna be um, an event that will give you hope in how you can make changes in your life. That is on September 30th from six to nine. Finally, we have a blood drive coming up on October 6th. That is by appointment only. Uh, we love this event. We do it several times a year. It really gives us a chance to give back tangibly to our community. So we would love if you would sign up for that event. Thank you for joining us today. We're looking forward to worshiping with you. Hi, ABC family. So glad you're tuning in this week. My name is Gerald. I'm discipleship pastor here. And if I could just open and be a little bit frank with you, there are some things that happen in life that really frustrate me. Uh, this last week I was hanging up some shades over one of my windows and that required hanging some clips up on the inside of the window sill. And I was using some hex headed screws and, and my screw gun with a, a hex bit on it. And the screw kept slipping out of the bit and it just frustrated me. And in fact, at one point I just called out and I said, come on guys, can't we design something that works better than this? Okay, so think about like a Phillips head screw versus a T25. The T25 has a flat face on it. When you bear down and put some pressure, it stays straighter. This hex thing wasn't doing that. The screws were flying, I was getting anxious and it just wasn't working the way it should. Well, maybe that illustration doesn't communicate with you. Maybe for you, it's something more simple like, let's say a, a nice cold drink on a hot day. You get done working and you're on your way home and you stop in at your favorite convenience store and you grab that cup and you're about ready to go to the soda fountain and pour your favorite beverage. And before you do, you know, you really long for that ice in the cup because it's cool, it's refreshing, and maybe for you, it's that special crunch ice stuff. So you grab your cup, you get over there, and then you see that sign that's on the soda machine that tells you that it's not working. And what does that sign say? It says, out of order, which is really interesting. That's an interesting thing about the English language. Wouldn't it be just much more economical if we just said, doesn't work? But that's not what it says. It says, out of order. Bottom line is, is order matters. And that's what we see in life, too. Sometimes life can get out of order. And yesterday or last week, when Jake was teaching us from the book of Titus, he taught us that God has a plan and an order for bringing out transformation in his world. That is, the church, and then family, and then society. God's order of transformation is to use strong churches that make disciples, that build healthy families, and these healthy families go into society and they bring change. Well, as we dive back into the preaching series on our way through the book of Titus, we find that Titus is serving on the island of Crete. I was doing some research, uh, reading the ESV study Bible on the background information about the island of Crete, and I learned this. The ancient historian Polybius wrote that it's almost impossible to find personal conduct more treacherous or public policy more unjust than on Crete. It sounds like 
people's lives were just reckless and public policy was just a mess. Cicero also stated, moral principles are so divergent or so messed up that Cretans consider highway robbery honorable. Can you imagine that? I mean, I think our society is a bit messed up, but I think we can all agree that none of us are celebrating when we see somebody getting robbed along the side of a highway. Well, that was Crete. And we could say that life on Crete was out of order. And that matters because we serve a God who is a God of order. All you have to do is pick up your Bible and begin reading in the book of Genesis, and you can see that order matters to God. Right on page 1, Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, we see that God speaks and he says, Let there be light, and out of nothing we have light. That's day 1. Day 2, he speaks again, and an expanse or a firmament, the heavens, are created. Day 3, he speaks again, and dry land emerges, and vegetation springs forth on his world and his earth. Day 4, he creates the suns and the stars to provide light during the day and the nights. Day five, he populates the earth with fish and birds, things that swim in the seas and sing things that fly in the sky. And on day six, he creates land animals and man. And Adam, the first man, is the pinnacle of God's creation. And he gives a special place in God's creation for man. That is to subdue the earth and exercise dominion over it. And he demonstrates that by delegating to Adam the job of naming the animals. He actually, in Genesis chapter 2, he brings all the animals before Adam and Adam names them. And think about it. Anything on earth here, when we have an artist who creates something, who gets to name the piece that is created? Usually it's the art, the artist, the creator. But here God, who has the right of naming the things that he has created, delegates that to Adam. It's a very important position that he gives to Adam. Adam's role is to work and keep the garden, Genesis 2.15. And Eve's role, according to God's design, is to be a helper corresponding to Adam. In every way that Adam exists, Eve was made corresponding to him to be a suitable helpmate to him. Now, I recognize that as I say that, our culture has really undermined or degraded what we mean when we say the word helper. It, it feels like an entry-level position to us. But what we need to understand is that a helper in God's eyes is a highly esteemed position. In fact, God himself calls himself a helper. Jesus was saying to his disciples in John chapter 14 that when I go, I'll send to you another helper. And that helper is the indwelling Holy Spirit. In Genesis, again, in chapter 2, verse 20, we see that Adam named his wife Eve, which means she's the mother of all the living. Then we get to Genesis chapter 3 which is typically called the fall, right? That's that point where Adam and Eve disobey God and they do eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And as they do, everything comes out of order. And this results in a curse. And in Genesis chapter 3, we read that, so Adam's job was to tend and keep the garden, but now as a result of his sin, the curse is that there will be thorns and thistles. His life just got harder right at the point of his job, right at the point of his role that God has given him to play in his created order. And for Eve, as the mother of all the living, the result of the curse for her is pain and complications in childbearing. Now that sounds harsh. But I want us to realize that this is actually an act of grace for God because God brings in the curse specific difficulty into our lives that meet us right where we are prone to put our identity for men, the things that we do, and for women, what it means to fulfill their role as wives and mothers. 
And this difficulty, this pain that God brings as a result of the curse is designed really to help us realize that we can't trust in ourselves, we can't trust in our identity, but it forces us to trust in God. And then the rest of the scriptures after Genesis 3 is all about God's plan of restoring order to his world through redemption. He sends Jesus, who is the second Adam, to live a perfectly sinless life in the way that Adam could not and did not do. And he lays down that sinless life on Calvary's cross in order to make perfect payment for sins so that all who trust him by faith have a shot at having their lives put back in order. There's freedom from the penalty of sin and freedom from the power of sin. And the fact of the matter is, is that today and ever since the cross, God is using his church to reorder his world. He's got one plan to restore order in this world, and that's his church, us, you, and me, preaching the life-changing message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the gospel of the grace of God. There is no plan B. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul encourages Timothy and he says, look, in the final days, things are going to be bad. People are going to be lovers of self. They'll be disrespectful. It's going to go from bad to worse. And the solution, 2 Timothy 4, preach the word. Why is that? Because Jesus Christ is coming back. Judgment day is coming. So God's plan to restore order in his world is to use his church preaching his gospel. And folks, our society is a mess. And we've got our work cut out for us. And frankly, that's why I'm here at ABC as discipleship pastor. The elders of ABC a, a year or so ago decided they needed and wanted to be more intentional with discipleship. It was time to be a church that makes disciples who makes disciples who make disciples. Because that's God's plan to restore order in his world. So today, not just today, but all fall as we continue to preach our way through the book of Titus, I want to encourage you to lean in and to listen. Because there's a role for each of us to play in God's plan to restore order to his world. So please turn with me in your Bibles to Titus. We will begin and continue our teaching here through Titus chapter 1. Today we're going to focus on verses 5 through 9. And the first thing we're going to notice is that God wants his church set in order. So as we begin to read and begin to study this passage together, Let's pause, let's pray, let's ask the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into this time. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name, thanking you and praising you for your wise plan of salvation, recognizing that you have an intended order that you created the world into and that that order got messed up by the fall, by sin. And we recognize that you are now in process on putting order back into your world. And that includes us. That includes our lives. So, Lord, as we read and study your word, as we seek to understand it, would you, by your Holy Spirit, enable us to have ears to hear so that we can receive and sense from you what it is that you are wanting to do to put our lives back in order so that having our lives put in order, we might step into society, step into your world, and be used by you to restore order to your world. So that in the end, we all might worship you, for you are worthy of our worship and our praise. We offer you ourselves now in Jesus' name. Amen. Titus chapter 1, beginning at verse 5. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town, as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. 
but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So the first thing that we see Paul giving instruction to Titus on here is that he wants to remind him of why he left him in Crete, and that is that Titus might put what remained into order. In verse 5, and it also says, and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Now this and can also be translated namely. I don't think that he wanted Titus to put into order what remained and then as a second step to appoint elders in every town. I think what he's saying is, Titus, I want you to put my church in order. Namely, I need you to appoint elders in every town. So that begs the question, what is an elder? And in this passage, there are two different words that are used here for elder. The first is presbyteros. We find that one in verse 5. That's the one that's translated elders that are to be in every town. It just means one who's relatively advanced and aged. And it's one with an official sort of capacity. The second word that he uses is episkopos, and that one is, uh, we find in verse 7, translated here in the ESV as overseer. That one's a more specific word. Uh, sometimes it's translated as bishop. It's one who has the responsibility of safeguarding or seeing to it that something is done in the correct way. A guardian. So elders are those shepherds and teachers that Jesus has given his church to equip the saints for the work of ministry. This is what Jeff taught us a couple of weeks ago. And there's much evidence in the New Testament that having multiple elders in each church, or in, as this passage would say, multiple elders in each town, it's the, really the, the norm. We find this a summary statement in the book of Acts, which is a record of the New Testament church being newly established shortly after the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came to indwell all believers. Acts chapter 14, verse 23, this summary statement is offered. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So it's the norm. It's God's plan to have order in his church, and that order looks like having a plurality of elders providing the leadership for each church. So why a plurality of elder leadership? Why that specifically as the order that God wants? There are a number of reasons, some of which I think um, I've discerned as I read the scriptures, and some of which that I have gleaned from this book called Church Elders by Jeremy Rennie. The first reason I think that a plurality of elders is God's order for the church is that plurality reflects the heart and the priorities of our triune God. So just as there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and each of them play a unique role in the redemptive plan of salvation history, the Father sending the Son, the Spirit causing Mary to conceive so that Jesus, the Son, is sent to earth as a human being, fully God, fully human. Jesus, the one who lives the sinless life, does so in the power of the Spirit. Do you see how the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are intertwined, all in pressing on toward achieving one common goal, the salvation of man, the restoration of order, in God's world. So in plurality, there are multiple elders, multiple men who are working together in a common goal in the church as they lead it, and that is to make disciples who make disciples. The second reason, in plurality, elders share the workload of leadership. This is just a practical adage that many hands make light work. So instead of having just one pastor doing all the oversight and all the leadership and all the discipleship in the church, having multiple elders means we have more people, more hands to the task. 
and it makes for lighter work for each individual elder. Third reason is that plurality provides a greater breadth of gifting in the leadership. No one man or woman could ever possess all the gifts necessary to provide faithful leadership in God's church. And having multiple leaders come together in one body, working together, leading the church, brings manifold gifting so that all the strengths that are necessary for the common good are represented there on the elder team. Fourth, in plurality, oversight of the congregation is sustainable because the elders act as pastors for one another. So in a team of elders, you've got built-in Christian community for encouragement. You've got built-in accountability so that if any one elder starts to deviate from the pathway of faithfulness or righteousness, the others can gently pull him back and restore him. And this one also leads into the fifth reason, which is this. Plurality protects the sheep from any one man's weakness or sin. Let me read a, a short paragraph here from Rennie's book, Church Elders. When elders are practicing a healthy plurality, it's harder for one man's views or tendencies to dominate because the elders offset one another. The gentler elders temper the more fiery ones. The activists move the analyzers toward actually making decisions. The big faith elders keep every decision from being one more exercise in fiscal conservative, conservatism and risk management, while the practical elders help the dreamers and the visionaries not to do stupid things under the pretext of trusting God. That sort of mutual balancing generates an atmosphere that's hard for egotists to tolerate. But even more to the point, plurality creates a structure for elders to call one another out when one of them gets off track. So having a plurality of elder leadership model in the church ultimately is a safeguard to the sheep because there are more men keeping their eyes tuned to God's word and their ears tuned to God's spirit so that any one man's sin has a less chance of negatively affecting the church. So, Titus' task was to put things that remained into order. This, this church on Crete was young. It was under the influence of less than godly leaders. And Paul says, Titus, I want you to put it into order. I want you to appoint elders in each town. So what would the pool of people be that he would draw from for this as he made these appointments? Who's qualified to serve as an elder in God's church? And we find here in verse 6, it starts very broad. If anyone is above reproach. Okay, what does it mean to be above reproach? That means your life has been ordered in such a way that for somebody to bring a charge against you, what people know of your life would say, no, I, I don't believe that could be possible. I don't see any display of that sort of sin or depravity in that man's life. I, that man lives above reproach. So if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers, not open to the charge of debauchery and insubordination. So we see that those who are qualified to serve as elders are those who have had their lives put back into order. Their family lives have been put back in order. They're to be a one-woman man. His affections are to be targeted toward his wife only. He's to be one who has faithful children who are ordered under his leadership, his parental authority together with his wife. So an elder is one who is to be above reproach in his family life. So when people look at his family life, they see this one knows how to lead a wife to lead children in such a way that they follow. Verse 7 is a, a clarifying statement that says, For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. Now, the root of the word translated as steward is house. So this word means that an overseer is a house manager. 
And that means they manage the house itself, the physical structure, right? And everything in it, the possessions, but most importantly, in its most precious contents, are the souls, the people that live there. Eternal souls that are careening toward hell until God's order is restored through faith in Jesus. There's a parallel passage here that talks about the qualifications of elders in the book of Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And verses 4 and 5 state it this way. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? So the proving ground for anyone as they are seeking to live their life and to demonstrate that they are capable of being invited into church leadership is to have a family life or a home life that is in order. They must have been able to demonstrate that they can lead their family before they have been entrusted with leadership in God's family, in God's house. So the first qualification is that um, this man who is to be an elder candidate must have his family life in order. Secondly, his social life must be in order. We see this in the second half of verse 7 and in verse 8. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. So there's a list of vices that he's not supposed to demonstrate. He's not supposed to be arrogant. He's supposed to be looking to the Lord for his sense of worth, not to himself. He's not supposed to be quick-tempered, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. James chapter 1, verse 20. He's not a drunkard. He's to find strength to press on in the difficulties of life in the Holy Spirit, not by seeking relief from the pressures of life through alcohol. He's not to be violent. Romans 12, verse 19 says, Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And he's also not to be greedy for gain. He's one that is supposed to look to the Lord as his provider and not to himself. So if those are the things he's not supposed to be about, what are the things that are to characterize his life? We find this in verse 8. He's to be hospitable, warm and welcoming, treating strangers like family. He's to be a lover of good, not a lover of darkness. He's to be self-controlled, keeping his fickle urges under, of his flesh under control. He's to be upright or just. He's to be righteous. He's to be holy, set apart for God and his service. And he's to be disciplined. He's got a plan to grow in Christ, and he's sticking to it. You know, we have an elder team here at ABC, and it's a mix of men from various walks of life with various vocations. We have builders. We have a photographer. We have retired pastors. We have guys from a variety of walks of life with a variety of giftings. And all of these men are shepherds and teachers because those are the qualifications for being an elder. But in addition to being shepherds and teachers, they have a manifold breadth of gifting. These guys love Jesus and they love you, the flock of Christ. And we have unique personalities. But I can tell you this, in my two months of being here as your discipleship pastor, I've interacted with the elders enough to have seen firsthand how much they love you. And they have unique personalities. Many of us are quirky. And God uses that to steer this church. And this has been the norm at ABC for decades. If you listen to Pastor Tom as he gave his comments and told his story about what brought him here to ABC back in the 80s, it was the health of the elder team that was the big drawing card for him coming here. And I can just testify to the same thing. As Lisa and I candidated here and interacted with the elder team, we recognized that there was a level of health here amongst the elders 
that we were blessed by. ABC Church, your elders love Jesus, your elders love you, and they take very seriously this call that God has placed on their life to lead you. These are men who have had their lives put back in order. Their family life is in order. Their social life is in order. And they are well qualified to lead this church. You can entrust your soul to their leadership because they have entrusted themselves to the lordship and the leadership of Christ. And can we just recognize that this is evidence of a supernatural work of God? Because no man's life is in this order when he is born. No one's life is in this order because we work hard at it. It is only because the Holy Spirit of God miraculously intervenes in the life of a person and begins to put it back into order. And I want to just lean in here and recognize that each one of us is to live a life so that we're qualified to serve in this way. We are to be above reproach as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to live our lives in a way that our family lives are in order, where the people that we most closely interact with know that we love them and are having a voice into our life. All of us should allow the Holy Spirit to have his way in our life. All of us should live a life that gives display to the glory of God under the Lordship of Christ and according to the leading of the Spirit as he puts us back into order. And we'll see as we continue to preach our way through this book that chapter 2 clearly lays out what this order is to look like. There are unique assignments for older men, for older women, for younger men, for younger women. Each one of us has a unique role to play in God's church as he continues to put lives in order. So let me ask you this. Where do you need your life to be put back into order? It's okay to admit that you need help. It's okay to recognize that you don't have it all together. That's what faithful discipleship is, is we agree with God about what he says about himself and his word. We agree with God with what he says about us as sinners, and we submit ourselves to the order of his word, to the leading of the spirit, and the church is here to help each one of us with this. So where is it that you need assistance? Where is it you need to invite others into your life so that God can get fresh traction and restore his order into your life and family? Do you need to get into God's word on a more regular basis? Do you need to pray with your family members or your closer friends? Do you need to lead them to Jesus? Maybe you need to come to celebrate recovery. Maybe you need to get involved in a group or a men's Bible study or a women's Bible study. In some way, you maybe need to get involved in some level of community so that you can know people and be known and start letting God order your life according to his word. And this leads us to the final qualification for church leaders. Those who would be elders must be above reproach. They must be above reproach in their family life. They must be above reproach in their interactions with other members of society. And thirdly, they must be above reproach. They must have their spiritual lives put in order. We see this in verse 9. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and able to rebuke those who contradict it. You must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, to the Bible, which is God's word. It's the standard for truth and righteousness. Our, the Bible is our means for being put back into order. This is the standard. This is the thing, the, this is the, the way that we know what the straight and narrow path looks like. The Bible calls this process of having our lives put back into order a big word. That big word is sanctification. It's the process of being made holy. 
resulting in a changed lifestyle. Jesus said this in John chapter 17, verse 17, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, Paul says this to the members of the church in Thessalonica, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Every once in a while, the Bible gets so specific and so clear. You ever wonder what God's will is? His will for your life is your sanctification, your growth in holiness. And that means, according to this verse, we grow in sexual purity. Maybe that's one of the things you need to see put back into order, according to God's word. And that's why our second core value is this. We will become committed to knowing and teaching the Bible. We will seek to study, teach, memorize, and obey God's word, knowing that it is the most tangible tool for transformation. We will uphold the Bible as absolute truth. And together with prayer, this is the only weapon that God gives us as we do spiritual battle against the spiritual forces of darkness. God's word is available to us. So brothers and sisters, let's grasp it firmly. Let's hold to it as the truth. Let's hold it up to ourselves as a mirror that shows us who God is and shows us who we are in light of who God says he is. We must hold firmly to God's word so that each elder may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. That word means doctrine that leads toward health. Doctrine is just a big fancy word that means the body of teaching. God's word is designed to show you what it means to live a healthy life, a healthy life that has been put in order according to God's word. We do this so that we can instruct others to know how to follow God and how to obey him, how to order our lives according to his word, and so that we might rebuke those who contradict it. There are people who are, whose lives are out of order, and by living their lives of out of, being out of order, they are seeking to disorder other people's lives. And the pastor teacher's job, according to this passage, is to show the error in their thinking and in their practice using God's word. 2 Timothy Chapter 3, verse 16 says this, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So scripture is inspired. It's inspired by God. It's profitable for teaching, for showing us what the straight and narrow way is for reproof, for revealing to us when we have deviated from the straight and narrow way, for correction, for showing us how to get back on that path, and for training in righteousness, for teaching us how to stay on that path. Why? So that we might be equipped and ready for every good work. So in other words, the church that holds firmly to God's word is God's plan to restore order in his world. Or as Jake said it last week, a discipling church makes strong families that change society for the better. So therefore, both in Crete and in California, the church needs to be in order according to God's word. That means we have elders leading us, a plurality of elders. And church leaders must be those whose lives have been put into order by God himself according to God's word in the power of God. God's Holy Spirit, so that other people's lives might be put in order through our teaching of God's Word. This task is huge. If we are to have the impact on our local society that God wants us to have, we need every one of you who call ABC Church your home being continually equipped for this work of ministry that God is doing in His world. For our church to be in order, each of our members needs to be regularly seeking to have our lives put back into order by God's word. 
which, according to this passage, is the trustworthy word as taught, or the faith-worthy word as taught. And we are working behind the scenes right now to put things in order so that we can someday soon see each one of you involved in a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two discipling relationship. Maybe you already are, but we are really earnestly wanting to see you simplify what you understand discipleship to be and how you live that out in your lives. We want you to realize that relationships are essential to discipleship. There are three components that are non-negotiable. The relationship that you have with someone. The fact that you will spend time in God's word seeking to understand it and seeking to apply it to your lives. And then the fact that you'll be spending time praying, asking the Holy Spirit to allow that truth to, to land on your mind as truth and to be lived out in your life in a way that bears fruit to the glory of God. So my question to you as we bring this to a close is, what is your next step? Where is it that God wants to bring his order to your life according to his word in the power of his Holy Spirit? Where does your life need to be put more and more into order? Maybe for some of you it's just to admit that you're in a set of sad circumstances and you just need to grieve. Maybe you need to share that with another brother or a sister and just allow them to sit with you and weep. Maybe for some of you, you need to read your Bible a little more frequently than you currently do, exposing yourself to God's truth. Maybe for some of you, you need to admit that you need help with your addictions. Maybe you need to shut off the game console or shut off the TV and stop living in that fantasy world and start engaging in the real world, filled with real and messy relationships. Whatever it is, ask the Lord. Lord, where is it that I need your order restored in my life? We'll have people that are eager to pray with you. You can send your prayers in by contacting the church office, by emailing them in. Check out our website. We have people that are eager to pray with you and walk with you through this process. Don't go this alone. Discipleship is a relational process, and that's what the church is about. We want to see your lives put back in order, even as we ourselves are having our lives put back in order, recognizing that as we interact with one another, we have a sharpening effect on one another. As we point each other to God's word and pray for God's word to bear fruit in and through our lives. So let's pray. Let's listen to the Spirit, and let's take that step of faith and see God's order brought about in our lives. And through our lives, God's order brought about in society. Let's pray. Father, you've made it clear to us that you are a God of order and that our sin has really disordered our lives. But your wise plan through Jesus is to reorder our lives bring them back into order according to your wise and original creation design. And Lord, each of us is in a different place on this continuum of having our lives reordered. And we want to partner with you today as you take that next step or would have invite us into that next step. So Lord, I pray for these, my brothers and sisters, give them ears to hear. Holy Spirit, communicate to them Invite them to take that next step of obedience. Illumine for them the pathway where they can take their next step. And would you be so gracious as to reward them for taking that step. Protect them from the evil one. Protect them from the lies of the enemy. And give them sweet relationships with other brothers and sisters in Christ who can walk this road of order with them. So, Lord, we thank you for your word. It's our earnest desire to be ordered by you according to your word. And we're powerless to bring that about in and of ourself. We, re we rely on you, Lord Jesus, and your Holy Spirit to do this among us. And we know that as you do, 
you'll do it in a way that brings honor and glory to God our Father who is worthy of our worship and praise. We offer you ourselves now in Jesus' name for his glory. Amen.